There's a lighthouse on a hillside that overlooks life's sea. And when I am tossed about, it sends out a light that I might see. Again, I'm glad everybody's here. Uh, I'm Mike McDonald, and we are in a Bible study. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. We left off at uh, verse 13 last week. Uh, if you're a believer, which I'm sure all of you are, uh, the point right now is to have no unconfessed sin in your life. So silently confess to God the Father all known sins since your last confession, and He will automatically forgive you of that. You don't have to ask for forgiveness. You just have to confess it. If you're not a believer, uh, confession of sin is totally irrelevant. The only thing relevant to you is believe that Jesus Christ is your Savior. So let's go to the Father now and do that. Gracious Father, we come before You thankful for Your many provisions for us, thankful for Your Word, thankful for this place we can gather together and proclaim Your Word. We ask, Father, that You help us understand it and help us apply it to our lives that we may better represent You today. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Uh, Paul is uh, trying to correct some problems that uh, the Corinthians are having. And now he's going to try to explain uh, why some of them aren't picking up on this stuff. Okay, and so verse 14, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. Now this is, the, this is the principle that is really difficult to get across to an unbeliever. In fact, it's better not to even try. Uh, because you're telling them they're lacking something that you have. And so that's automatically offensive. Uh, but uh, that's, the, that's, the per, that's the point. They are lacking something. So now Paul is going to bring before us in this passage, this passage goes from uh, chapter 2, verse 14 to chapter 3, verse 8. That's all one passage. Uh, we won't cover that today, but that's what, that's what the passage is. So we often say that there are only two classes of people in the world. Christians are, are bad about saying that. Um, and that is believers and non-believers are uh, people who have been regenerated and have eternal life and people who haven't. Those two classes of people. Well, Paul's going to separate one of those classes into two classes. So he's going to bring us three classes of people. Um, and the separation is of the believers. Okay? Uh, another point that's really difficult to get across to believers uh, is that uh, they can be carnal. And what Paul is going to do is give us the natural man, the carnal man, and the spiritual man. And uh, it's, all, it's all real simple. You, you know the process. I mean, you even know the principle. It, it may have, the wording may be uh, strange to you. So he says, But a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit. That natural man has to do with the soul. And it is... And this is P-S-U-C-H-I-O-S. Psuchios. And that is soulish, the natural man. And all that, all that refers to is this is a man that has been born. He is born that way. You know, all humans are born, naturally born. Um, and that's belonging to the soul. Suke. So he may be good, he may be bad, 
He may be smart. He may be dumb. Uh, he may be honest. He may be dishonest. The natural man can be all of those things. Natural people can do good things, okay? However, none of it is acceptable to God, all right? So, <clears throat> this man receives not. He does not receive. Uh, so, so, we have the verb to receive, um, and then we have a negative in front of it. Udetectai. So, we, this means receive as in welcome that. Uh, uh, he can hear the words. He can know what the words mean, but he cannot receive the message. He cannot understand what the words are trying to get across to him because, Paul goes ahead and tells you why, because these things are spiritually discerned. He even gets more specific than that. So remember now, we're talking about spiritual. Spiritual discern. We're talking about somebody who does not have a human spirit that is in uh, able to receive and communicate with God the Father. And it's not the human spirit's fault, it's that God the Father won't communicate with him uh, because he is uh, not a believer. The natural man, uh, uh, many believers, and, and me included, sometimes refer to this as a dead human spirit. But then you have to go on and, and explain what dead means in Scripture. And in the Greek, all it means is you're separated from something. Uh, it never means that you no longer exist. It just means something has been separated. So it must be, that spirit must be reborn. Must be reborn again. Uh, we got to that in John, Gospel of John chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Jesus went over that very clearly with Nicodemus. You know, you have to be born of the flesh. That means you have to be born naturally. And you have to be born of the spirit also. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 23... Paul confirms that the believer has a spirit, has a soul, and has a body. That's 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Yeah, okay. Well, that's... Cannot. He cannot. It dunatas. He's unable to. Yeah, he does. He has a human spirit, but it. Yeah. A natural man. Yeah. What? What? what well, that's really not true. Uh, he does have a human spirit, uh, but it's not uh, uh, communicating with God the Father. It has to be reborn, just like your physical body is going to have to be regenerated to before you can uh, exist in space, okay? Before you can go before God the Father and not die, uh, you, your body has to be regenerated. So you have a resurrection body. Same thing is true with the human spirit. It has to be regenerated to have communication uh, with God the Father. Uh, so uh, that's all we're talking about. So here Paul addresses the natural man who has not been born again by the Holy Spirit. And he says, for they are foolishness to him. And that's a little bit uh, tricky here because what the Greek says is for foolishness to him it is. So it's not... It's not necessarily the things that you're saying, the, the things that the preacher is saying. The whole idea is, is, is uh, addressed in the Greek as one thing. Nothing coming from God is acceptable. It's all, it is foolishness, is, is what he's talking about. Earlier, Paul covered the fact that Christ and Him crucified was foolishness to the unbeliever. Now... Now, now, speaking of more information, no problem. Uh, 5.23. Okay, earlier um, uh, we covered the fact that Christ and Him crucified was foolishness. Same word. Um, 
to the unbeliever, now speaking of information from God the Father, uh, things of the Spirit, uh, that too is foolishness to the natural man. He refuses them and he rejects them. And he cannot. Uh, it's not that he will not. It's, it's uh, dunatai. It's, uh, he is unable to. He's unable to understand or to know spiritual phenomena. Uh, and, and when we get to, uh, let's see, he cannot, uh, what do we have? And he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Uh, and again, we have in the English, they are spiritually appraised. And in the Greek, we have, it is spiritually discerned. So it's as a whole group, it's not the individual things that's the problem. It's the whole, the whole idea of something coming from God the Father cannot be understood by a unbeliever until. In fact, the only thing that Scripture says uh, the, that the unbeliever can understand is when the Holy Spirit. And he does this for every human that ever has ever accepted the Lord's provision. He intercedes on that human's behalf so that he can understand the gospel message. That, that always happens. That's the only way an unbeliever can understand the gospel message. That's why when you hear preachers tell you that when the rapture occurs, the Holy Spirit is going to be taken off the earth. Well, no, that's not what the Bible says. He's not going to be taken off the earth or nobody on earth would ever accept Jesus as their Savior. He's going to stop restraining the Satan in his activity on earth. And true, the church is going to be taken off. All believers are going to be taken off. And the Holy Spirit is in the believers. So that part, but the Holy Spirit is going to be here. He's omnipresent just like the other two members of the Godhead. You can't take him away from anything. He's omnipresent. He's always there. So uh, that's, he, he's going to be here. So the unbeliever, the natural man, has not been reborn again spiritually. His human spirit is still said to be separated from God. He has no ability to evaluate spiritual information. It's not that he will not. It's a matter of dunatai. He is unable to. He does not have the facility to do that. He is unable, gunai, he's unable to know that information. So this is information uh, that is spiritually discerned. Now, looking at this a little closer, the phrase, they are foolishness to him, I, and I touched on this earlier, they are foolishness to him, actually reads, it is foolishness to him. And the phrase, they are spiritually appraised, actually reads, it is spiritually appraised. So we're talking about the whole idea of, of information coming from God the Father. Both of these phrases are translated as referring to the things of the Spirit. However, the Greek seems to be referring to the Spirit of God, period. Singular. There is no communication between the Spirit of God and the natural man, except... His intercession making the gospel understandable if and when the natural man indicates an interest. Uh, and like I've said before, um, I mean, missionaries go out on their, uh, and I've heard missionaries come to the church and make reports and, and, and somebody asks them why they do that and they say, well, if I don't do it, these people will never, never hear. And, and and they will go to hell uh, and not ever have a chance. Well, that is absolutely non-biblical. Uh, we're not responsible for people going to heaven or hell. Uh, occasionally, uh, we are given the opportunity to present the gospel to somebody. And, and, and when we do that, whether they accept the gospel or not, when we present it, uh, then we are going to be rewarded for that. We are doing God's work doing that. Uh, but uh, uh, whether or not they receive it is totally up to them. So uh, this is nothing about the Spirit of God that is that the natural man considers anything but foolishness. Verse 15. 
But the, let's see, but he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man. So that is, uh, that's kind of misleading too, isn't it? Okay, so now Paul introduces, in contrast, the believer. Okay, he uses two words to designate the believer in verse 15. We see spiritual, pneumatikos, and in verse 31, I'm, I'm sorry, in chapter 3, verse 1, we have the word carnal, uh, sarkinois. Um, so he says, but he who is spiritual appraises all things. Uh, the spiritual man discerns on one hand uh, all things. In contrast, the spiritual man, born again spiritually uh, by the Holy Spirit, has a regenerated human spirit that can receive from God. In other words, he is a believer that Jesus Christ is the Savior, but there's more, okay? This believer is in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. And how do we know that? Because he can appraise these things. The carnal person is always a believer out of fellowship. That person is just like me when I commit a sin and until I confess that sin, uh, I'm out of fellowship with the Holy Spirit. So I would be carnal uh, and unable to please God in any way, as a matter of fact. <laughs> is it first this one which is, which is now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your whole spirit, soul, and body. Mm. That's that's right. That's right. The point the point there, the reason I referred you there is is so you will know it's scriptural. Paul has confirmed that it is scriptural that you have a spirit, a soul, and a body. You have those three things. Okay? That's all that verse was... was. Spirit is the Holy Spirit. The soul is... No, you start out with the human spirit. Okay. okay? When God breathes the breath of life into you, He breathes into you uh, spiritual life, soul life, and human life. Okay? okay? And uh, then the soul is what? I, I would, uh, I would prefer not to try to describe that. <laughs> uh, the scripture, uh, scripture says that uh, the word of God can separate the soul and the spirit. Uh, I have a lot of trouble separating those things. Uh, the soul, uh, I know some differences. The soul is what needs to be saved uh, because sin attaches to the soul. Uh, your human spirit. Uh, when you are regenerated and you are a believer, the human spirit does not, uh, sin does not attach to that. And as a matter of fact, there's nothing uh, that is incorporated into your human spirit after you become a believer uh, that is incorrect. It, it only accepts the correct information. Like if I get up here and I start talking to you and, and I give you a bunch of bad doctrine, uh, that's not going to be in your human. It's going to be... Uh, it's going to be in your soul and it'll all be corrected uh, in the, when you receive a resurrection body, if not before. But that regenerated human spirit is, is from God. It's, uh, it's there and it's, uh, it's perfect. So, um, so let's see, we are at, uh, oh, we're back on First Thessalonians. Okay. So, but, the, uh, but he who is spiritual appraises. All right, so now Paul introduces, in contrast, the believer. He uses two words to designate the believer. In verse 15, we see spiritual, pneumatikos. Uh, in, in verse 1 of chapter 3, we have sarkinos. So, but he who is spiritual appraises all things. This spiritual man discerns, on one hand, all things. In contrast... Uh, the born-again person 
has a regenerated human spirit. He received from God. In other words, he is a believer. The believer is in fellowship because he is able to appraise all things. We know that because of what he can do. He can appraise, and that is anacrine, and it means to examine, to inquire, or to discern. All things, panta, it's just all things. Appraises is the same word we had back in verse 14. Uh, the natural man uh, is unable to do, uh, sukikos, uh, is unable to receive this information. He that is spiritual is able to discern all things. Uh, he is able to see the difference. You, with unconfessed sin in your life, are able to discern the difference between proper doctrine and false doctrine. Something from God and something that's not from God. Uh, of course, you need the Holy Spirit's help to do that, but you have that ability uh, to do that. Yet He Himself is appraised by no man. That's the part that, that gets people. So uh, it, it's easier to um, understand that if you will uh, change that appraised to discern. He is discerned by no man. So what that really means is that you're, you as a believer are not going to be able to be understood by an unbeliever because you, uh, other men cannot understand you. If, the, if they are not spiritual, they say, well, that's a strange person. And, and uh, people have said that about uh, some of my relatives. But anyway... Uh, other men cannot understand. Uh, he's strange. He does not seem to, to have normal uh, desires or motives. This man is judged only by God. If you are a believer uh, and you are in fellowship, you are judged only by God. Uh, Paul goes through that. And he will, we will go through it a little bit more in chapter 4, uh, verses 3 through 5. You cannot be understood by unregenerate people, uh, chapter 2, verse 15, uh, or by worldly believers. Worldly believers are believers who are out of fellowship. can be any one of us. Uh, we are, are not uh, in fellowship with the Holy Spirit. That's the, that's the part that really gets tricky because uh, I've told people, if you are in fellowship with the Holy Spirit, and you do good things, okay, you will please God doing those good things. You are capable of actually producing divine good, divine good production in your life. If you are a believer and you are out of fellowship, you can do exactly the same things to the people around you and you will be producing human good, which is unacceptable to God the Father. Uh, when, when, God, when God told Adam and Eve, don't eat of that tree uh, because you will learn the difference between, or you will learn good and evil, He rejects both of those things. He rejects human good just as much as He rejects human evil. It's only divine good production uh, that God the Father accepts. And we can produce that through the Holy Spirit working in us if we are a believer and if we are in fellowship. And that's the only time we can. So these statements regard spiritual matters, okay? Uh, when he can't understand you, uh, the unbeliever can't understand you, doesn't understand what you're talking about. This has to do with spiritual matters. Uh, I don't think this has to do with uh, legal or illegal matters or actually right or wrong matters. Uh, are good or bad matters, uh, the unbeliever can, can discern those as well as we can. Uh, spiritual matters are out of his uh, uh, wheelhouse. So, um, the difference is 1 John 1-9. Yeah, the difference is 1 John 1-9, if we confess our sin. Okay, so, in the New King James has added the word rightly before judged. So, in the New King James... Uh, verse 15. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is 
rightly judged by no man. And rightly there is in italics, meaning it's not, it's not in the Greek. But the idea is there. That's a perfect, he, he cannot rightly judge you because uh, it, the, the things of you uh, are spiritually discerned on that. So uh, the idea is there. Uh, so the believer, let's see, the idea there is to exclude as judges the unbeliever and the carnal believer, the believer who is continually out of fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Judged is a correct translation, anakrinetai. However, uh, here it's a little bit misleading because it, it tends to have us thinking about good and bad, legal and illegal, uh, and what it really uh, correctly translated, uh, it would be discerned are understood. Verse 16. Uh, For who has known the mind of the Lord that He should instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So, verse, all right. For who has known the mind of the Lord that He may instruct him, but we have the mind of Christ. So both those are pretty close to the same thing. So here Paul is uh, referring back to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 13, and he quotes that uh, partially to show that the believer is not subject to judgment when it comes to spiritual issues because the spiritual believer possesses the mind of Christ. And where is it? Right here, the Bible. I mean... I don't have the mind of Christ. I have the ability, since I'm a believer, if I'm in fellowship, to understand the mind of Christ. But, you know, for who has known the mind of the Lord? That's, that's part of uh, Isaiah. Uh, you can compare Romans chapter 8, verses 6, 7, and 8 uh, with possessing the mind of Christ. So, has known is from... Gnosko, and it means what you would think to take in knowledge. And the aorist tense, which is, just means that it's happened, it doesn't tell you anything about the action, uh, whether it's progressive or wanted it once it, uh, in one time only. It just means that this action has happened. In the aorist tense, it, it translates uh, uh, ascertained or realized uh, instead of uh, to take in knowledge. Uh, that he should instruct him. Okay, that he should instruct, uh, let's see, is a uh, future active indicative, uh, what you would expect. Uh, the word is used elsewhere to mean bring together or compare or examine closely. Uh, so we're talking about examining or, or proving. Here it is used to mean to teach or instruct, uh, comparing acts, uh, chapter 19, verse 33, uh, with the same thing. So in verse 15, the one just before this, Paul writes that the spiritual man, the mature believer, appraises all things, or he can discern all things, yet he is discerned or appraised by no man. But do not, don't stop reading there, <laughs> because we are discerned by somebody. So don't stop reading there, because Paul did not stop there. Now he quotes Isaiah 40, verse 13, referring to Yahweh. And uh, Bob, you'll be interested in this. Uh, he is referring to Yahweh, uh, the second person of the Trinity. No one has discerned his mind and no one will instruct him. Okay, Lord, in your translations, is probably in all caps right there. Uh, let's see. Uh, chapter 16. Yeah. For who has known the mind of the Lord? And the Lord is in all caps. Well, when Lord is in all caps, it means we're talking about the second person of the Trinity, Yahweh. When, when, this, uh, when this is uh, written um, in the Septuagint, when, when Isaiah 40 is written, uh, it is uh, translated Yahweh. 
and I will try to write that up so you can see the difference. It's, 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 there's a difference between Lord, and, and this is correctly translated Lord, but in the, uh, in the Old Testament, What this this is a yod and it's this is a, a this is a W no I'm getting carried away H W E H so uh, and as you know Hebrew is read from right to left so what you have here is Yahweh. So when when we're talking about we're talking about the Lord, huh? Yeah, it's re- it's read from right to left. No, no, no. It's it's start up here, go down. So what what we have there is Yahweh, uh, and there's a word for Lord. That's a completely different word. Uh, it is. Uh, Oh, I did that wrong. I'm not real good at this. So th- those are the those are the uh, consonants, and that's the only thing Hebrew had to begin with. And then they started putting jots and tittles in there to uh, help us understand it. And that this is Adonai. A D O N A I. Although it written, so Adonai is Lord. Okay, um, Adonai is Lord. yeah, Adonai, and and Yahweh is said to be so sacred, and they and the uh, the Jews were so afraid of using the Lord's name in vain that every time they came to this word in Scripture, they pronounced it Adonai. They wouldn't say Yahweh. No, no Jewish person who, you know, is really Hebrew and really believes in the Jewish uh, religion would would ever say the word Yahweh. It always is pronounced Adonai. So, yeah, they don't have a problem using it anyway now, do they? So, no one has no one has ascertained his mind except God the Father. Who will instruct him? So Adonai is is exclusively used as a divine name. Uh, so we're talking about. I mean, uh, people were called Lord uh, if they uh, if you had a servant, you were that servant's Lord. Uh, in fact, uh, Sarah was even instructed to call Abraham Lord, but those were not in all caps. Uh, that just meant he was had a position higher than her. Uh, but uh, this is all caps. This is the Lord. So now Paul stops quoting Isaiah and he writes, "But we have the mind of Christ." All right, come right in. Yes, that's exactly right. We've been wondering about you. Uh, so this is not a direct correlation between. Uh, no, this is not only. A direct correlation between Yahweh and Christ. See, this this gives us a direct correlation between Yahweh, the second person of the Trinity, and Jesus Christ. It is a challenge. It is a challenge to these Corinthian believers and to us. Um, the mind of Christ is the Word of God. When Paul wrote this, the the Word of God wasn't complete. He was still receiving, and other people were still receiving direct revelation from uh, the second person of the Trinity and from the Holy Spirit. Uh, So he was writing that. When John completed the revelation in about 96 A.D., uh, that stopped. And there's no more direct revelation 
from God. That's, that's why we have uh, the canon of Scripture. So uh, we refer to that as the Old and the New Testament. Biblical spirituality is a mindset that we have, we have to work for that. That's, that's in reference to uh, uh, learning scriptures hard enough, but then applying it to your life is where it really gets hard because you have to admit that you're doing something wrong and you have to change it. So uh, we, we have a mindset, a way of viewing life. It comes from welcoming the things of God by means of His Word. You can't do that unless you study His Word. The Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, reveals to us the things of God through His Word our, and, and, and into our human spirit. God and the Lord do not talk to people today. Uh, and sometimes preachers get carried away and say, uh, the Lord told me. Uh, I, I fully believe that the Lord uh, helps us establish things in our mind, maybe even gives us ideas. Uh, he obviously directs our paths if we're in fellowship with Him. But God does not talk to people, and He has not done that since John finished the Revelation on the Isle of Patmos. The unbeliever thinks this is foolishness. Okay, period. Uh, uh, and we had, I, did I tell you all that word for foolishness? Um, I have a question. Go ahead. So sometimes I'll be like venting to the Lord. And I think I hear a small still voice talking to me. What is that? I don't know what that is. Okay. Uh, so then, sometimes I, I think I want to listen to it. Because I feel like it's him telling me. Because I'm always saying God must like this. If, yeah. I speak to my heart. Yeah, I can understand uh, that you pray for so guidance. Talking about <laughs> uh, you can pray for guidance, but uh, uh, for God to speak directly to you would nullify this. You might as well just throw this away if he's going to speak to you. Uh, he did that before the canon of Scripture was complete. He did that uh, in order for us to have the canon of Scripture. Uh, but he doesn't do that now. He will do that again after the church has been raptured. Uh, we're going to have angels giving us the gospel. And we're going to have, uh, I mean, the gospel is going to be everywhere uh, during the tribulation. Uh, and the Lord will be communicating with people directly again, but He's not doing that now. This is through the Holy Spirit uh, that He is guiding you and, uh, and enhancing you of being able to follow His directions. But uh, I've, I know there's a lot of really uh, important people who think God talks to them. Um, I, uh, I disagree with that. Old Testament, yeah, oh, okay. yeah, my my people hear my voice, yeah. Okay. No, he, I, we don't hear God's voice now. Sorry, uh, we, but but uh, he, it's all right here. Uh, you have to, you have, the Bible and you have to, you have to mm. yeah, okay. study the Bible, yeah. Uh, and we are just about out of time. Let me see if I can. Uh, so, I was going to give you a definition of what? Oh, <laughs> foolishness. foolishness. Yeah, I was going to give you the spiritual word for foolishness. It's it's uh, uh, it's moron. Uh, but he who is spiritually, that's where we get our word moron. I can't figure. I can't find out where it's where it's. Oh, here we go in verse in verse fourteen. Maria. M O R I A. Maria.
Berea is foolishness, and that's where we get our word moron. Uh, and that's exactly what it is. Uh, the uh, actual spiritual information uh, that we ascertain and discern from Scripture through the Holy Spirit is what is considered uh, foolishness by unbelievers. They, can't, they have no way of understanding it. And we will stop there. What, uh, any questions? I'm sure you have questions. In verse 16. For who has known the mind of the Lord that we should instruct him? And the Lord is Chiron? What it says here, that's the reason I was asking because if this is all bonus creek, I don't want to open this anymore. Is it an X or is it a K? I don't know what that word is. It's not Christ, Christos. Uh, that would be uh, start out with a chi, which is a which is a uh, Christu, C H R I S T O U, but I don't know what Cairo is. But I wouldn't throw it away because I don't know much Greek. <laughs> that might be good. Uh, and, and it might be a, a transliteration of Hebrew. Yeah, as Lord. Yeah. Okay. And that's on verse 16. How's that? Kuru? I'll just show you here. I was trying to show you. Where did we go to? Verse 16. There it is. Kuru, yeah, okay. This is, that is Lord. Okay. okay. Yeah. Whew. We got that. <laughs> we got that straightened out, maybe. Yeah, that's Greek. Yeah, um, Adonai is uh, Adonai is Hebrew. Yeah, Kuriu is is a uh, Lord, but uh, uh, and they would pronounce Kuriu. The the Greeks would. Yeah. Anything else? Okay. Gracious Father, thank you for today. Thank you for, thank you for your word. We ask, Father, that you help us understand this, know where we are, know how to represent you, know how to proclaim you. As we go forth from here, we ask that you help us represent you honorably. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.